As I was approaching the car from the safest possible angle, uh, I could see that he was looking at me through the side mirror. The first shot hit me to the chest. At the same time, I raised my left hand, put it to, to my face, uh, and you can see that the second bullet hit the base of the ring finger and the middle finger there, took the top of the uh, my finger off and also uh, grazed the top of my eyebrow. McDonald, by that time, is on the passenger side of the vehicle. McDonald engages with his shotgun, where the offender fires a number of rounds at McDonald, one of which hits him in the chest. The offender puts his car into drive. McDonald, at the same time, is firing at him with his shotgun and doing a tactical reload in the course of firing at him. Absolutely ballsy effort. He was, he was shot in the chest, uh, didn't bat an eyelid. You know, as far as he knew, he was mortally wounded. As I saw the panel van driving off, I thought that he, he was successful again in shooting a further two police and making his escape good. As the panel van disappears, no one knows if one of the police shotgun blasts has hit its target. For the fourth time in eight months, police have been involved in a gun battle with a man they believe to be Mad Max. And once again, the gunman appears to have won out. But there's a chance the police shotgun has hit its target. With no radio reception, the two injured officers have to get to help fast. That day I will never forget when Rod McDonald knocked on my door. Hello? When I opened the door, there was a man with a red T-shirt marked with blood. Can I use your phone, please? Yes, Is straight you through there, light? straight through there. I opened the door wide, let him in, and I ran out the door scared and frightened and uh, as I ran past the car I saw there's a man in the car who didn't look quite right and I saw that um, he had been shot. You were right love, yeah. your partner's just gone in to call an ambulance. I couldn't start to, to express the excruciating pain that I was going through at that stage because the first shot went in through the chest followed into my shoulder and the bone between the uh, elbow and the shoulder was completely splintered. I looked down at my uh, left hand and the, the blood was just pouring out. I said to the guy, would you like a glass of water? I had to actually give it to him myself to drink because uh, he couldn't lift up his hand or his head or anything. I think I was told later on that I'd lost something like 11 pints of blood, which is virtually the, uh, the entire amount of blood. And, in fact, I did die, so uh, I was revived by the ambulance crew. When the alarm was raised, my home was swarmed with police officers. While the injured policemen were being treated, the hunt was still on for Mad Max. Police on the scene could see tyre tracks from the shooting site through a broken fence to a nearby paddock. Police helicopter detected light coloured panel van off the Hume Highway, nor uh, north of Melbourne. The vehicle was approached by the Special Operations Group. Christic was there to identify the person in the panel van to see if he was actually Max Clark. As we approached the panel van, we had no idea who was in it, what they were armed with, or what they were going to do there was a good possibility that one of the most dangerous gunmen in the history of Victoria was laying there waiting for us. We could see or that there was somebody slouched on the driver's seat. We gradually moved up, moved up very slowly, being very mindful of the fact that, you know, he, he, may, he may have just been like playing possum, you don't know. and I felt for a pulse, there was no pulse present. 
and his wig was askew. So uh, I thought to myself, I still don't know who this guy is. I actually grabbed the wig and lifted it off his head and then bang. His face just came straight out of the photo. I said, that's Mad Max. Max had been mortally wounded by one of the police shotgun blasts, had lost control of his car and ended up in the paddock where he died. Today, their eight-month-long manhunt came to a violent conclusion. In the end, six policemen have been shot and wounded, one of them left a paraplegic, and one man was dead. The saga of Pavel Marinoff, alias Max Clark, dubbed by the media as Mad Max, was finally over. These are events that uh, there are life-changing events for all the people that are involved. And it was a situation that I could see that that just had come to an end as far as the offender was concerned. But uh, the legacy of the Mad Max episode uh, will last forever in many minds. I remember at times having times of, of uncontrolled crying where I just wanted this image to come, to get out of my head. I was sick of seeing it all the time, seeing him staring at me, seeing the shot, the noise, the whole light and sound of the whole incident. And, and it took some time to gain control of that. If he had been caught alive and jailed, he would probably be out and walking the streets uh, within a, a number of years. And there would be the possibility that I would bump into him and I did not know how I could cope with that. So it was certainly a, a great relief to me that he'd been shot and killed. The 41-year-old father of three is the third Victorian paraplegic policeman to resume duties this year. Brian Stooks stayed in the police force until his retirement, determined Mad Max would not rob him of his ambition or his dignity. I think Brian's a hero, and I know in the community he is thought of. He's been to school to speak to the children about what heroes are like and what heroes do. He's incredible, his patience and um, his acceptance is amazing. He never complains. But for all involved in the Mad Max case, there are still many unanswered questions. When uh, Marinoff died on the 25th of February 1986, I, as an investigator, felt that I hadn't solved the crime completely. And by that I mean I wasn't afforded the opportunity to find out, to ask him firsthand why it was that he took the actions that he did back in June the previous year. Why he snapped, why he, he took such brutal action against Brian Stook and, and Peter Steele. It's something that I will never know. All I have is a constant reminder of the events that took place on the 25th of February, 1996.